So first of all, tissue impairment diagnosis versus movement diagnosis. What do you treat? Um, when you see somebody who has a supraspinatus tear, you don't treat the tear, you treat what is causing the tear. So if there's an acute injury, you want to bring down the inflammation. If it's wear and tear, you want to figure out why are they doing a certain activity that's causing more tissue damage to that area. So let's say you have somebody, um, Carrie Walsh, she has a right shoulder injury. They, they keep on taping it. Well, it looks like she's not getting sufficient upward rotation, right? So you want to add some upward rotation because if she's not getting enough, that supraspinase can be impinged and cause constant injury as she's playing volleyball. Um, nocebo effect. I bring this up. I presented it when I had to do uh, my presentation at um, OSU, and then Michael said he wanted me to bring this up again. The nocebo effect. Has anybody ever heard of this? Basically, the, the thought that something is going to cause pain, and then you then you start to feel that pain. So similar to if you give somebody a tissue diagnosis, they might start thinking, okay, well, I'm more impaired than I am, and start looking up things and say, well, now I have this impairment, and now I start to feel this and that. Uh, a great example is I had a patient uh, seeing for a rotator cuff repair last day of the visit, and I said, okay, well, what can you not do? She said, well, I can do just about everything. And I said, well, I noticed you're still getting rides to physical therapy. So she goes, well, I don't drive anymore. And I said, okay, well, that's interesting. Why don't you drive? She said, 20 years ago, a doctor told me I have a herniated disc not to drive. And I said, oh, okay. Well, do you have pain? And she goes, well, no, I don't have any pain. He just told me not to drive because I have a herniated disc. Going back to, well, I think I have a problem because I have this diagnosis. Now I'm stuck on it. Well, if we just said, you just have a flexion syndrome or flexion rotation, they don't get stuck on that. They just know, well, we have to improve that motion, and then they can move on past that. And that's why it's pretty important to me to try to stay away from a diagnosis. Unless you get some of those patients who come in acutely and you're like, oh, well, I'm suspecting something. I want you to go back to the doctor, but I'm not going to tell them this is what you have, right? So going back to what I said earlier, uh, tired of causing people pain because all of our special tests to see what tissue source is the problem are all pain provoking, right? And then you get the patient that comes in and goes, okay, well, I have shoulder pain. You do all the impingement tests and you say, well, you have impingement because I reproduced your pain. They'll go, well, I already know I have pain with these things. You didn't have to do it to me. I could have just told you, right? I want to know what you could do to make me feel better. That's what patients will tell you. So the two concepts that I wanted to review, because I think Joanne talked about it, was hypermobility. So there's three types of hypermobility. You have something that just has too much range of motion. So um, normal range of motion of a specific joint and it goes past that. Then you have the um, too much joint mobility. So let's say the joint is rolling, gliding, or sliding too far, or just translating in general. And then finally, you have frequency of motion. So if somebody goes to raise their arm into flexion and they side bend, or their, their spinous process, you can feel it rotate. Well, it shouldn't be doing that. It should be more stable, right? So if you have go, somebody go through shoulder flexion, you feel their spinous processes and they're rotating, well, you have to stabilize. We give people deep neck flexor exercises, but do we give them to them when they're doing shoulder motions, right? Um, so that's important to know if they are getting that rotation, they can cause friction and increase in condition. So hypermobility thinks something's moving too much causing their irritation and their wear and tear injury. Tightness, so something is short or stiff. I'm trying to differentiate um, what's going on. So a short muscle is something that has less sarcomeres and series. The muscle is actually shorter and you have to lengthen that muscle. Then you have stiffness. Stiffness is something relative to another muscle. So um, if you have more more uh, sarcomeres in parallel compared to another muscle, well, you're gonna cause ab abnormal motion. So let's say you go into prone and you do a knee bend. Well, if they have tight quads and their lumbar spine goes into an um, extension and their pelvis goes into an anterior tilt, well, we need to stabilize at the core to prevent this extension going on, right? Because every time they do anything where they're bending their knee, they can go into extension. So when you look at stuff, things are gonna either move too much or they're gonna um, move in an abnormal direction. So um, I don't think I talked about it, but we're gonna talk about quickly PICR. Do you guys know what that is? Did Joanne talk about that when she was here last? Okay, so I'll talk about it quickly. It's the path of instantaneous center of rotation. And what it really means is a joint's gonna go through uh, a motion, 
right? So let's say we want to go through extension of the hip. If we go and have a patient go to an extension, but yet they deviate into a rotation, or they go into abduction or adduction, they're going off that path, right? So something's pulling it in a certain direction that it shouldn't be going, and the body's gonna move through its path of least resistance. So when you're going through tests, you're looking at function, you're even doing manual muscle tests or range of motion, not just looking at the joint that you're measuring, but look at everything that's going on. Somebody goes through shoulder flexion again, they go into side bend rotation, or they go into lumbar extension, well, that could lead to a back pain problem. Even though they're here for back, we're looking at the shoulder. Or we might be looking down the chain, right? So the beauty about this is uh, MSI, you're looking at the whole body, right? You're trying to fix everything. Sometimes you'll get that patient where you get the shoulder better, but yet they come back six months later with the same problem or something slightly different because you need to improve the part that had a problem either lower or higher up. So, Going back to short and stiff, like I said, limited range of motion, something's short. It doesn't get through that full range. Now, something that's stiff is it can still get through that full range, but it's gonna cause compensatory motion at an adjacent point. And as we go through today, we're gonna look at posture, and we're gonna look at, look at function, and uh, standing, and then quadruped. So I wanna just review some of the syndromes. Um, not that important at this stage of the game, but basically um, looking at the planes that are abnormal. So let's say somebody goes into too much scapular internal rotation and anterior tilt, well that's their syndrome. You know during most of the movements that they're gonna be doing, they're gonna internally rotate too much and anteriorly tilt. So what's great about the syndromes are when you name something, it's easy for another practitioner to understand what's going on, right? And for this, you don't have to memorize the syndrome, just know, okay, what plane of motion is too much or not enough? And for diagnosing, you want to go with it's going too far in a certain plane. So in the scapula, you have internal rotation, anterior tilt, or posterior tilt, externally rotate, elevate, depress, downwardly rotate, and upwardly rotate. So when we look at that stuff today, you're just going to look at those ranges. So the red ones correlate to the black one? Like oh, the red ones in the second, the first great one. question. So the red ones, uh, they're just the more common diagnoses that you'll see. So most people that will come in will tend to have those three syndromes. And the other ones are less common, but they are still um, there. And then humoral diagnoses, when we look at that, um, so the humerus is going to either glide forward, to glide too far up, will either medially rotate too much, um, there'll just be general hypermobility or a hypomobility syndrome, somebody who has like um, adhesive capsulitis. Um, there are other things I know during this year, Shirley brought up inferior glide, right, that's one might go, yeah, so that's not in the books or in our notes, but um, just basically if it's going too far in a certain direction that it shouldn't be going. Think of it like that. So today we're going to look at posture, like I said, function, and then quadruped. So when we look at posture, it's always good to take a step back and just say, what's the general name of the posture? Is it a normal posture? Is there a uh, sway back? Is there a lordotic posture, flat back? Because um, even though you're treating a specific source, if you just change the general standing and static posture, sometimes your symptoms improve right there and then. Because the body's gonna figure out how to get it back to where it's comfortable. So if you improve the flat back posture and you bring it here, the head will start to come back as opposed to have that forward head, right? So sometimes it's as simple as that, it's just improve their posture. So take a step back, give it a postural name. And I actually have a handout for all you guys when we go through lab. Um, to where it's just going to break it out. I'll tell you the ranges of motion so you don't have to refer back to the slides. Um, it makes it a little bit easier. So, for the scapula, the spine of the scap wants to be at T3. In order for you to find T3, the easiest is you go into cervical flexion, and when you feel the SP stick out the most, that's going to be C7, and then you can count down to T3 and see if the spine of the scap matches. Uh, medial border is going to be three inches for myself. It's when I separate my two fingers like so. Some people it's just the width of the hand. So I recommend if you just measure on your body, 
what these ranges are. You don't have to bring out a tape measure each and every time. Um, but I think for the most part, people tend to have the three inches right here. Scapular rotation, you want to have the medial border vertical. If you see any deviation downwards, it's downwardly rotated. Scapular internal rotation, so it should have a little bit of the scapula. I think sometimes we call it protraction where you're here. Um, you don't want to be too far forward because that's going to cause some problems with the shoulders, so you want to bring those shoulder blades back. Um, anterior tilt, just a little bit of tilt. And usually my gauges, 10 degrees isn't very much. So if you could see it and it's obvious, it's probably 10 degrees. That's usually my rule of thumb. Um, if it's close, I like to think of it, that's probably where it should be. Where you're thinking, eh, is it anteriorly tilted or not? And now this is from the posterior view. You're looking at the humerus. So sometimes you'll see people standing, their humerus will be out here as opposed to just resting down. Um, that's usually a sign that there's a superior glide or something too tight holding that shoulder up. And you're gonna have to get more of an inferior glide to it. So from the lateral view, you wanna look at where the ear and the acromion meet. The humeral head does, it, does not want to be greater than uh, one third past the acromion. So it should be sitting basically underneath the acromion. The humerus um, is not flexed or extended. So you wanna just keep it right here. If it's pulled back, you wanna bring them further forward and say, does that feel better? Or if it's flexed forward, see if you could just bring it back to a neutral position. And then the elbow and slight flexion. So you always want to have that because it's the tonicity of the biceps. If it's too straight, then again, it could be where they are standing to. So you want to shift them, and then sometimes the center of mass changing causes them to bend their elbows where they need to be, and bring that tonicity back. And then from the anterior view, AC joint is about 5 to 26 degrees. So with that great range, again, what I like to think of is it looks like it's inclined, then it needs to be there. If it's flat or down, then it doesn't want to be there. We need to fix it. Sternal angle, you're going to check where this is because our scapula sits on our ribcage. The ribcage isn't even, then that's going to cause the shoulder to work improperly, right? Because as we go through the range of motion, last 20 degrees, we're going to help get it from the thoracic spine. And then carrying angle, you don't want to have too much of a carrying angle, which is right here. You want to have it more straight down as opposed to deviating off to the side. So then we're thinking there's some pulling going on abnormally at the humerus. So zero to 15 doesn't matter if you're Um, no, it doesn't. All right, so if you guys want to get into lab and are tired of sitting, I'm gonna hand out these handouts. We'll go through lab, and I'll go through it with uh, somebody first. Maybe I could use Michael. Cool. And I'm very methodical with how I go through posture, so it's always the same way every single time. Uh, obviously, you guys could do it the way you want, but I usually like to start from the top and work down, because posture is important. It paints us a picture. It gives us a reason why we're going to look at something objectively. And also, when you look at something functionally, what happens is there's too much going on. So if you look at something statically, not moving, and they're already deviated to the side, it's probably going to become more pronounced as they go through movements. Um, so especially initially when you look at movements, it's good to look at it right off the bat. I didn't watch your shirt off. No, I'm just okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I always like to start from the back. Let me have you turn around and face the window. Um, can everybody see or do we need to change position? All right, so if we're going to look at somebody, again, you take a step back and you give them a postural name. So, sorry, let's have you turn, and we'll give it a postural name. So who wants to throw out what they think is going on? Is it swayed back? Is it flat back? Is it lordotic? Hypotic? Do we have to make up a new one for them? Perfect ten. Perfect ten. All right. Are you starting from your chart lumbar spine up, or are you just looking in general? I just look in general. So if we were to turn a little bit more, oh, sorry, there we go. What do we think is going on? 
Yeah, I would say pretty flat. Thoracic here, lumbar here, he doesn't get too much of a curve. He's, he's straight big, right? So with that, let's correct it and see what happens. He doesn't have any pain, but if he had pain, I would just be curious, can I put him where I need him to be? And see if it just changes how he feels. So with all this, you see something abnormal, correct it, see if it feels better, right? So I want him to have a little bit more of an anterior tilt, good. <coughs> Now I just want you to cave in just a little bit here, there, and just a little bit more of an anterior tilt for me. And now bring your chest forward like somebody's pulling the string. Perfect. Right there. And then if you had pain, it's feel better, worse or the same. All right. So then gave it a name. All right. Now I can start honing in to certain areas. All right. Now turn the face that way. So looking at upper cervical, I would say head on neck is that side bent or not? Is it in neutral, right? Looks like he's bending to the side. Do we all say to the left? Yeah. Is the left side bent here? Okay. And then we'll say neck on trunk. What would you say? Still left, yeah. Still left, so everything's pulling them left. You're thinking something is pulling them this way, right? As we get lower, we're seeing that there's probably something going on with the scapula position too, right? So, if we come down, I like to come across and say, okay, well, here's T3, or here's T3. Here's the spine of the scap, and I come to the middle, right? So, it's a little abnormal. Now, is it elevated or depressed, right? So, if this was the impaired side, I know in school they used to say, well, then you just relate it to the contralateral side, but we have our norms. As T3, we'll have them look down. So, look down for me. All right, C7, and look straight ahead. And we have T1, T2, T3, that's exactly where he needs to be. Now he's T4, T4 and a half, I'll give him. There's a T4 and a half. All right, so then I'll be curious, okay, well, can I correct him to where that needs to be? And does that make this feel better? Or can I correct him here and see if that makes the whole shoulder feel better depending on where he has pain, right? And then relax everything down to where you were before. And I, I usually go with one change at a time, because if I do too much, then I get a little confused. I, I was curious if you, if you correct the area that is bothering him first, or do you go from head down for, for doing the one-step corrections? So usually I'll go at each spot I see something different. Okay. Um, if it's close, I generally, depending on how much time I have, won't do it. But if it seems like it stands out a lot, yeah, I'll stick to that as I'm going through each step, though. All right? So then I'll come in, I'll say, okay, well, here's the medial border to here. He's at three inches. He's actually a little bit close here on the right. So relative to the other side, he's less. So I'm curious, do I bring him back? Well, that's a little too much. Or do I actually have him relax here? So now I'm starting to think, okay, well, why is he using his AD ductors on this side, even though his problem might be on the other side? Just things that are going through my head, right? Things that are abnormal. And I'm thinking, okay, what's going on? Can I change this, even though the symptoms are different here, because that's going to have a different pull from what's going on on the spine too, right? So then, coming across, and I'll go to there and see, okay, well, he looks pretty vertical, right? And he looks vertical there. Then I'm looking at the internal rotation of his scapula, and Basically, you want 30 to 40 degrees, and I think I wrote down all the degrees that we want to have. Now, 30, you're going to have to eye goni it. Um, what I like to do is I come across here and I say, okay, well, is it about 30 degrees, more or less? And I'd say he's a little bit internally rotated, but not big time. And it's a little bit less on this side. And it's just eyeing it up. You're looking for big things that stand out. And then for anterior tilt, coming up straight to there and seeing, okay, well, he is anterior tilted because 10 degrees isn't very much. If we look on a goni, right, how much is 10 degrees? Well, if you come in, I'm pretty much thinking if he's already got an anterior tilt, I'll just confirm it by coming up and that angle is way bigger, right? So then here, I'm gonna wanna tilt him back and say, does it feel better, worse, or the same? Because sometimes it could feel better because if it's just pain right here, it could have the glenohumeral head sit better in the joint. Right? Because then if they come in inflamed, we can't do much anyway. Well, we could just improve their posture and educate them. So right off the bat, I need you to be here 
and a little bit up, you have to make sure your shoulder is in this position throughout your day. If it's a lot of work and you get tired, maybe support it. Support it in a sling and a chair with an armrest. Right? So now we're educating them because we already know things that are going to help them. All right. Now looking at the humerus coming down, looking at the windows, is he abducted or is he dropped down there? Right? So I think he's looking pretty good. We could all agree. I see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, from the side view, lateral view, is there anything else that you guys want to talk about or bring up? So people might have other things that they look at. So say they were coming in to you and his initial complaint was the shoulder. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's what Ken was asking if I'm not um, correct. But, so would you, because they're complaining of the shoulder, is that where you would camp out or do you go step by step and do the rest of it when you're already getting the complaint from them that it's their shoulders that's bothering them? Okay, if it's my full evaluation, mm -hmm. I go through everything oh. and I try not to bias myself because I just want to see, okay, what's standing out? Because if I hone in, I'm just going to bias my thought process. So if I start to see these things, he's got more of a depression in the anterior tilt, I'm going to look at those during movement. Those are the big things that stand out. We already know he side bends to the left. I'm curious to see what unilateral shoulder flexion is. So that's what's going through my head right now, but I'm not jumping to something just yet. Now, if I have somebody shows up 20 minutes late to their eval and I only have 30 minutes left, then what I'm going to do is, okay, maybe I'll hone in a little bit more. That's me. I don't know if you do something. Okay. And Michael, agreed? Okay. Um, all right. Um, anything else from the back, or do you guys want to go to the side? So I was just kind of wondering because the lumbar spine looks off too. Like, how far down the chain do you go? Oh, so. You know. weight bears on one leg more than the other, so I'm not sure. Like, do you go all the way down and back up? Yeah, I would be curious. It, it really depends on his irritability too. Okay. Um, if he's highly irritable, I might look further down because I'm looking for anything that changes. Right? Just takes the edge off. I'll tell the patient. Just take the edge off because they're going to be in so much pain anyway. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll look further down if big things stand out. So if he's really hiked up here and he's flat back, then I'm going to change this and make him stay there after I change everything else. And then at the end, if I'm curious, I'm going to put the whole picture together and just say, stand like this and what does everything feel like? But I'm always piecing it one by one right now. Great question. Any other questions? Alright, so from the side. So from the side we're looking at cervical. Is he in a flex position or extended? Head on neck. Yeah, I would say he's a little extended. Neck on trunk. Is it flex extended? On neck on trunk? Yeah, neck on trunk. So I would say he might be a little bit flexed down here and extended there, so it's relative to that, but yeah. I would say he's extended because he's probably anterior translating a little bit. Uh, and a little cue too is that hinge crease is going on, so I'm thinking he gets a lot of movement through that area right now. So then I'm coming down, and I got the acromion right here, going on to the humeral head. I'm looking for it to be less than one third, meaning if it's here, or too far anteriorly glided, or glid, is that a word? No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's too far forward, and then I would say, okay, let's bring them back to where we need to be. Does that feel better or worse? The same. Similar to a joint mode, right? Where you want to posterior glide, does that feel better? Same idea. Can we get him to be here? Because if we're actually looking at him, he's pretty tense, his shoulder is in a little bit of extension. If you just bring him here, that might sit him back too, right? Again, changing the posture, because if he's constantly causing him pain, he's moderate to high irritability, Let's bring things down, right? So throughout your day, just make sure you're not pulling your arm back. Keep your elbow past your, your midline right here, all right? And that's what I would tell him if it feels better. And then I'd say, okay, go back to what's normal and let me continue looking down the shape. All right, looking at that carrying, or the uh, flexion of the elbow, I'd say 15, 10 to 15 degrees, no more, no less. Right. Now from the front, what I'm gonna be looking at Again, just to verify, head on neck, neck on trunk, because I want to see if I am seeing these things. And 
I don't know if uh, you guys go through it, the same thing over and over again from front to back with the alignment, but I just want to make sure I'm seeing it and I didn't see something incorrectly. Sometimes skin tone can be a little different from one side to the other depending on how they can or muscle bulk can throw me off. So I always want to just verify, 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 and then correct it. So head on neck, neck on trunk, looking at clavicle angle, is it more than five degrees, which he is, because if you can see it, it's going to be more. Some other things I'll look at that I didn't put on the sheet, also look at muscle bulk too, um, just more curiosity. Uh, looking at sternal angle, so I'll come in, are you ticklish? I usually throw that, cut this side. All right, so take a deep breath in, and breath out. All right, and we're looking for about 90 degrees, because if he has uh, less than that, something's pulling him down, right? And we might have to actually have him loosen this up for him to get, <coughs> say, sh full shoulder flexion, right? Because if he's constantly crunching here using his abdominals, he's not going to get that full range, causing that impingement, right? Or if there's a flare on one side and the other side is a little bit uh, non flared or down. So then we're thinking, is there a rotational component? Um, looking at that carrying angle, he doesn't have any carrying angle, and also we want a little 60 degrees of lateral rotation, or you just don't want it to be fully forward, fully internally rotated. And you've got the humerus right here. Now, let's say you do see this turned in like so. How it changed the scapula if I know the scapula was an issue. And say, does that change here? Because then it's a scapular issue, not a humeral issue going on. Do you, do you feel like yeah, so we said, I think it was the left side, right? The left side he needs to be in that posterior tilt a little bit more. He needs to be in a little less internal rotation. So that's where he needs to be. And we need him to be a little bit higher to there. This is where I want you to stand for the rest of your life. So then you take him like you want him to stay that way too. Yeah, and some people I might just tape him and just yeah, say, okay, right. maybe we can get the right. muscles to shorten a little bit if we do it enough, or we get your body to just be more aware of its proprioception of where it needs to be, right? Um, so do we want to go through posture? Do we have questions about this? So we can do a little bit of lab. Okay. Let's do it. Now you don't have to take off your shirt, but we can <laughs> see through with our hands, right? <laughs> Let's say you go through shoulder flexion, they raise their arm up, you're seeing if the AC joint lines up with C6, C7 area, and we already know where C7 is because we looked at posture, right? If it doesn't, and they have pain, I'll bring them up to where they need to be. Does that feel better or worse or the same, right? So if somebody's getting some impingement, they have a supraspinatus partial tear going on, well, if they keep on a budding, all we need to do is make sure they get to where they need to be so then they clear and they don't hit the impromium, right? And then you're looking for that double divot, so basically at the glenohumeral joint and AC joint, um, at the glenohumeral joint, you don't see a divot. Well, they're probably not getting sufficient inferior gliding and they're gliding too high with the humeral head and they're butting against the chromium too. So we have to make sure, okay, well, what's fine? This is what I like to do. I don't know if they teach it in the class, but they get to the point where they feel pain. I'll hold them there and I'll just say, relax your arm and just let it go and I'll hold it. Does that change? How you feel because then I'm thinking okay well it's a muscle activation issue right and then I have to say okay well we need to strengthen you and we'll just stay away from that range until you can support yourself until we get higher um, similar to looking at the scapula when they go to raise their arm about three inches you don't want to see it deviate too far off of that so if they retract too far or their scapular adductors don't hold them in place and they just fly forward with it right so you have to keep them where they need to be uh, upward rotation, again, if they're not there, we want to get them there. So they go to raise their arm, that scapula stays down, and they're not at that 60 degrees from here down. I'm going to help them get there, similar to the scapular assist test, right? And with the scapular assist test, we just assist them, but my goal is to make sure they get to the 60. So I have a, a, a goal I'm shooting for, a finish line, right? Scapular internal rotation, they start at 40, 30 to 40 degrees. As they go up, they should actually externally rotate as they come up. If they're not, again, fix it, see if it feels better, right? I want you to get to that extra rotation. Because now I'm playing with the different planes, which is giving me my tissue sources that I want to test. Length, strength of certain muscles when I go to the table. The table is verification, right? 
Everything I'm looking at now is function. Can I correct it? But I want to verify when I get to the table what my hypotheses are of what's short, stiff, what's causing too much motion at the joints that could cause tissue injury. All right. Um, now, if they go to raise their arm up, especially into abduction, you stick your finger right here. Now, is it, and this is about an inch for me, is it half of that from his scapula to the rib cage? If it's too far off, then he doesn't have that support from the serratus anterior to keep him there. And then usually it's coincided with the upward rotation, but not all the time. But for most of the time it is. And then come down. With the posterior tilting, they should get posterior tilt. Um, so we're thinking like uh, uh, lower lat needs to pull back to get him there. Uh, or something is still keeping him forward. So, like I said, he's got an anterior tilt issue here. He's probably going to have an issue when he goes to raise the arm and not getting enough. He goes to raise the arm up, and he actually does a good job. We just need a tiny bit more. And but you do get it at the end. So watch his range as it goes, and then just at the end he gets that posterior tilt just slightly, and I want a little bit more from him. Because now I'm honing in. I already know he's got an anterior tilt thing going on, so now I'm pretty much waiting for it. But I don't want to bias myself because I'm still looking at the other planes of motion. Um, as he goes up, does the humerus rotate in a equilateral rotation? Do you see enough of that crease? Or does he stay in medial rotation? Because then I'm thinking, okay, is there a pec thing that's pulling him into medial rotation? Or does he not have enough support from the subscap to hold him, right? position so pecs pulling them too hard um, clavicular retraction so this should be pulled back which will coincide with the, the external rotation um, and big thing is making sure there's no cervical motion so let's say he does unilateral shoulder flexion I'm gonna put my fingers on the SPs and this is probably one of the big things that has changed my practice for cervical spine because I'm feeling for what's going on the spinous processes. So you should not see any of this sliding going on, which he's not getting, I'm just amplifying it. So that would be going on. Okay, well, what does he have to do? He has to stabilize the deep neck flexors because that's a stability muscle, or those are stability muscles, to make sure that this doesn't rotate. So somebody who comes in with neck pain, they say it gets burning right here, right around that big lump that they'll say, and they're reaching up into the cabinets a lot, the, or, or they do a lot of overhead work, electricians, well, are they not stabilizing and every time they raise their arm, they're just rotating through the cervical spine each and every time. And now when they go to work above their head, do they have to keep their deep neck flexors on as they go, right? To prevent this rotation as they raise their arm. Um, Quadruped, um, basically looking at everything just in a different plane, right? So I, I'm just curious to see, okay, what muscles can still work against gravity, or gravity is now acting on it differently. Um, generally, my favorite position is it's easier to manipulate the body to. They're on their hands and knees and I could just support them. Sometimes it's harder when they're standing and they have very heavy arms. Somebody who's 6'6", uh, six, six, just really big, well, I'll just put them on their hands and knees and it's easier for me to lift them too. Um, and then, uh, just due to time we'll go through, do we have time for that? No, I guess we have two minutes. It's probably not enough time. <laughs> but um, yeah, so basically the gist is, something's moving too much. Why is it moving too much? Is something short or stiff pulling it in that direction? So that when I'm starting to think about my hypotheses of where everything is, I'm thinking also what tissues are pulling them that way. And then if something's abnormal, correct it, put it where it needs to be, does it feel better? And then that's a form of treatment. Secondary testing is correcting it, feels better. We'll do this at home now, and I want to make sure that you can do it when you get home. When you raise your arm up, just tilt your shoulder blade back as you go up. Not just the back and down, right? Because we're specific to planes. We know which plane is being affected. So if we start adding other things that they shouldn't have, that could cause a problem, right? So if it's just an anterior tilt issue, just work on posterior tilting, right? Um, if they don't get enough external rotation of the scapula during shoulder raising, just get that. Don't worry about adduction or getting posterior tilt, right? Because then that can cause, again, more problems if they are where they need to be. So hopefully that answered some things or just created more questions for people. Okay, so 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, would that be too much 
Other questions that people had before I do that, or okay. So um, if you guys want, you can stand up. <coughs> so just like with standing posture, what I like to do is just see how the resting position is. And with Michael, I would probably change a couple of things, right? So you can also see he's not in this 90 degree position. I bring him back for sure. Um, he looks a little tense here. Yep, I'll let him drop down. So let me have you just uh, raise this left arm for me. And just like I saw um, in standing, I want the same position. So I want this to be C6, C7, and he actually doesn't get high enough. So when you raise your arm, reach a little bit for, for let's say, the person over there, right? <laughs> so, Ryan. Ryan. So now he's getting where he needs to be. So I'm thinking, okay, well, he didn't have that in standing. Now, there's a muscle that's not strong enough, but it's not super weak, right? So we could actually strengthen here. I'd put probably an a exercise ball underneath his hand, and I'd say, okay, go to reach over your head each and every time just to get something to elevate that scapula, right? Go to raise the arm up again. And he actually doesn't get enough extra rotation, too. So this is where we need to be. Hold that. And now I'm just getting curious. I'd feel for what muscles and having trouble keeping it there. So we were not gonna go over muscle tests, but I'm curious now of middle and lower chap and what that's doing. Because he's just having a lot of trouble externally rotating the scapula. Um, those were tested in prone. Yeah, those would be tested in prone. Um, we could also look at quadruped rocking too. Um, if he is pressing through his arms, can he still get there? I'm thinking now that I look at open chain, if he doesn't have a problem here, I think maybe it's a strength thing. If he does have the problem pushing through the hands, it's not as much of a demand. I'm thinking a little bit more motor control, but it could still be a strength thing. Now I'm just trying to prioritize and give it percentages of where I'm gonna put most of my treatment on. So, hands here, and just rock back. Don't let your hands move. Oh, okay, yes. Right? And then again, seeing where everything lines up because everything I saw in standing posture, now I'm seeing, okay, how does it go when he's in this position? Is it again there or is something else happening? And rock back, just stay right there. So I'm gonna verify he gets there, right? He gets in a cervical extension. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe levator upper trap is pulling too hard. Relax it a little bit more. There you go, sit back. Good. He does get insufficient upward just compared to this side that's not much he does get that 60 so I wouldn't change that big thing for him would be in quadruped raising the arm and I'd say okay let's get him a little bit higher up and let's get him a little bit extra rotation and keep that there hold it hold it hold it good and back down so so you're facilitating the muscle contraction after the back when you say hold it, hold it, hold it. Yeah, because okay. basically I am I have him where I want him to be. And I don't want him to, and, and I want him to be able to do it and hold it there on his own without me supporting him. And then if he, a pain-free range? Pain-free range if he is having pain, yes. So if he is having pain, then I'd say, okay, well, let's go. You have pain, all right. Now I'd be curious if you have pain right here. Well, I know you need to still get a little bit more elevation. Does that change your pain, yes or no? or if it's the external rotation, change your pain, yes or no. If it changes the pain, then we'll keep on going through the range. 